Sweat Equity Podcast and streaming show, the number one comedy business, business po- comedy podcast in the world. Pragmatic entrepreneurial advice with your raw dog talk. This is that's my high noon. I'm drinking. Uh, I'm scheduling conflict. No air today on the show. I have to apologize to Adam and Jack, our guests, because at the end of this at the end of this interview, it just my laptop just shut down. Uh, hey, man, listen to us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. If you're listening to this in your ear holes right now, go on the app, give us a five star review, subscribe, share it with that friend, that loved one, that that cousin, nephew, son, daughter, granddaughter, grandson that's trying to get their hustle on. Hopefully, this episode helps. Uh, and it's sponsored by Squarespace, the best drag and drop content management system to build a website, even if you don't know how to program or design. The designs are very girthy already. And uh, if you hit the link in our episode description, you'll get a discount. Holler if you hear me. Let's get this party started. Howdy, daddy. Woo! This is Jack. Hey guys. How you doing? doing? So we're an unconventional show already, and uh, (laughs) uh, I had a makeshift uh, setup in my uh, home office because as I was driving to our studio to meet my co-host Eric, he was like, "I can't make it," so we had a scheduling conflict. But no worries. I didn't want to reschedule with uh, some esteemed gentlemen as yourself. And so uh, if it looks a little weird on my side, I look a little shiny. I've just been running around in this floor. <laughs> it's all right, we little, got some of that up here. It's all right. I can't have the background of the mountains, the canyon like Adam has. Um, but we, I, we try to do this show real tight. So we're, we're rolling. Um, why don't you guys, uh, Instead of me fumbling through your introduction, why don't y'all introduce yourselves uh, to our audience? Okay. So uh, my name is Adam Sonhalter, and I'm a partner with Jack Mancini here in a company called Maximum Value Partners. It's a business coaching firm. Uh, We've been doing this for almost 20 years. We've also have a podcast called Dirty Secrets of Small Business. We've been doing that for over six years. We have about 320 episodes there. We help to kind of talk about small business stuff and and help uh, provide, provide some practical advice to small business owners across across the world. And Jack, anything to add? Oh, he told us about uh, uh, maximum value and the dirty secrets. Yeah, I had uh, 20 years, first, my first 20 years in business were with big corporations. And I broke off of that after about 20 years. And I've been... Uh, Messing in the world of small businesses, and we define that as under 25 employees, companies that have under 25 employees. And uh, I bought and sold uh, 16 companies since probably about 30 years since I left the big corporate world. Owned, operated, and uh, started a nonprofit, which turned over to the Mayo Clinic about four years ago, four or five years ago. It taught patients how to deal with their doctors. And uh, I love this small business world. It's just uh, Adam and I are kindred spirits at this. We, uh, we absolutely love helping them, and we do. We help them. We've had hundreds of clients, and if they stay coachable, and we've got a little criteria that, that uh, determines that, if they stay coachable, we'll, we'll be successful with them, and that means sustainable profits. Uh, we'll teach them how to do that, and well, we have a lot of fun. Well, I mean, what you're, you are is what I want to become. I love the small business atmosphere as well. Um, uh, not to, I won't butter your bread too much. You are a bit long in the tooth. Uh, That's right. You know. I got what, my mask on. Wait, let me take it off. <laughs> a different kind of mask, right? <laughs> we, we all wear some kind of mask, but that's a, that's a different podcast. That's, I'll say that's that. Right. That's, that's right. That's right. But you, uh, it, with that kind of resume, it seems like you don't need to do this. It sounds like you love doing it. Um, you know, I tried retiring try, twice, and uh, I'll never do it again. I never try to try. I'll, I will never try to <laughs> retire again. 
Well, I, I selfishly think about that as well. My dad's retired last couple of years and I think he's bored. Uh, he was an attorney for 35 years and it was one of those things where, you know, I feel like the people that keep working in something fulfilling in their, uh, let's call it advanced age, um, you know, I feel <laughs> like they live longer, but they, they live a more satisfied, you know, kind of twilight years. Um, is that... Is that kind of why you unretired like Tom Brady? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you stop and look at your your options, and uh, they aren't desirable. This this switch to small businesses years ago, decades ago, was probably the best decision I ever made in my life. And I got a great partner here. He's you know he's fast and he's good, and he worked on Wall Street for ten years, so he learned all the evils there. And uh, you know, we, we're a good team and we have a lot of fun with this. And we think of, you know, we would like to help these these small business owners and advocate for them. So how did you yeah. all meet? Craigslist? I used to golf. Yeah. <laughs> Craigslist. That's right. I used to golf and I met him. I, I he used to caddy for me. We have a little long time ago. Yeah. During, during really? my high school, yeah. yeah. During my high school and, and college years, I used to caddy. And, and so I caddy for Jack quite, quite a bit. And we, uh, we got reconnected again about 20 years ago when I was moving back from New York to Cleveland. And we kind of got caught up at that point. And that point, he was transitioning out of his latest company that he just sold. And he had started Maximum Value Partners with a couple other guys. And so we just kind of hit it off very, very well and just had a lot of fun doing this for the last 20 years. And your point's very well taken, Law. He, he's doing it because he, he loves doing it. Absolutely loves doing it. He's great at it. That's why he keeps doing it. Yeah. If you're Well, if you're, if you're an expert in your field and you are... Uh, satiated by the work why not why would you stop right Absolutely. and it sounds That's like right. your podcast I listened to your podcast a couple weeks back whenever we first scheduled this I think this is a reschedule um, and uh, you know I, our, ours is kind of a poor man's version you guys actually give a lot of uh, wisdom out there because you have a lot more experience but in a similar way I, I like that that y'all are almost in a way giving back and no one's forcing you to do it. Uh, you know, the y'all's podcast is a way to get that wisdom out there. And I, I try to do the same thing with our show. Eric and I both do it. You know, here's how we failed. And here's, here's the cheat code to getting out of your own way. Um, speaking, getting out of your own way, small business owners. So we're kind of cut from a similar cloth. I love helping small businesses. I love being a part of that story from getting them to successful goals and being just a tiny ingredient in that recipe. Um, what do you find? I have kind of a twofold question. What do people uh, reach out to you for? Like, what do they think they need help from you with on the coaching side? And what do they really need coaching with, but they don't really, they don't know that when they reach out? I'd say it's numbers oriented. And Adam can add stuff here too, obviously. We always add stuff to each other. And uh, um, not understanding the financial aspect of a business. And we often say, which is true, most small business owners uh, don't know what they don't know. So the challenge of teaching them has to start with something very elementary. And we do that, uh, you know, it's creating a profit plan, it, uh, not getting into debits and credits with accounting and keep it, keep it understandable for as long as you possibly can. And then you got to quit doing that and get a little serious about this stuff. So we, uh, we, we've had a run lately on helping people buy companies or sell their own. And by a run, you know, that's Adam's uh, early expertise before he, he joined the small business world, but, you know, an investment banker uh, and Wall Street. So he does that very well. And we've helped uh, just in the last couple of months, uh, you know, we've helped three people sell their business. And it's uh, proven very, very lucrative to them. And obviously we, we get a cut of that. And but more importantly, they, they have newfound freedom and a lot of money in their pockets. And uh, that's fun. I mean, that, that's a lot of fun. It's all, it's all been fun. We, every once in a while we get a bozo, but not usually. And, well, uh, yeah, the, the type of person that comes to you all with intent, I assume, is, uh, is one that is willing to concede that they need some help. 
right? Yeah, yeah. They usually get stuck somewhere, you know, in a, a couple of common places that they get stuck. They may get stuck just kind of bumping along. Maybe they've been in business for 10 or 12 years and they're kind of stuck at the same level for a number of years. And they aren't sure why. They aren't sure how to kind of break through that. Or they often get overwhelmed at times. You know, if they're growing so fast, you aren't sure what to pay attention to. And so a lot of times they'll come to us and say, hey, can you help me get organized? You know, or something like that. Help me, you know, know what to focus on. Because as an owner, you've got, you know, thousands of things, you know, vying for your attention every day. And if you focus on the wrong things, it can be very tough. So yeah, so folks usually come in and they realize that, that they don't know what they don't know is, you know, kind of what Jack was saying a little bit law. They start to realize that. They're not sure how to articulate it until they start to kind of meet with us and kind of talk about it. But uh we learned early on that not everybody is coachable. And so, you know, that's why we kind of create that coachability criteria because we're, you know, we're a couple of years in and we're having some great success with people and some folks not so great success. And so we're, we're looking, you know, internally trying to figure out, well, what can we do different? And maybe it's something that, that, that we're doing wrong. And what we kind of concluded was that we were, we weren't screening people out well enough, you know, in terms of, Hey, not everybody's going to be coachable and take it to it. Sometimes people just want to be you know, like, Hey, I know that's it. And I'm going to do it my way kind of thing. You know, we call those, old steel guys is what we call those folks. Yeah, I, 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 I would run into a similar problem when I had my agency and I was running that full time and I would find this, this rhythm of there's a certain percentage that would come to me for help. And then we go, all right, here's, here's the strategy. Here's the, even a business plan. Sometimes uh, I collaborate with and um, they just wouldn't want to follow through with it. And it, I'm like, this is why, why would you come to me? So uh, you, everybody has that friend that asks for advice, non-business advice, and they just really are going to do whatever they're going to do anyway. I kind of right. put it in that bucket. Like yeah. I have a buddy that had, <laughs> was always asking about uh, like romantic advice, you know, he's dating all the time, wasn't married for a long time. And I, I had to go like, Hey, bud, I think you're just asking to say this out loud, but you're going to do whatever you're going to do. Uh, do you I guess, how do you qualify those kind of people now? So when we're first talking to somebody, we tell them, so look, you know, we're interviewing you as much as you're interviewing us. And so, so as we're asking questions, Jack alluded to kind of, a, we have a 14 point criteria that, that we kind of go through. It's kind of a pass fail thing. And, and some of those 14 points are, are more heavily weighted. One of the key things though, is, is just overall curiosity. If you meet folks who are constantly trying to learn, trying to get better, so that could be, again, just in terms of they're asking questions, they're actually listening to people, they're reading books, they're, they're listening to podcasts, you know, they're, they're going to conferences, they're constantly trying to kind of get better. So if somebody has that kind of insatiable curiosity, that's usually a good, a good sign of, of either current or potential success for them. We also look for some past success. So you're, you know, so it doesn't necessarily mean in business, it could be just in, you know, maybe they, they were in athletics, you know, growing up or, or, or they're in the, the debate club, but if they don't know what success looks like, it's often hard to kind of show it to them, you know? And so we often look for, for that. So we, we have a lot of our clients who, who've had some very successful athletic careers in the past, you know, um, you know, so again, they know what, what success looks and smells like from that standpoint. The, the, the dirty secret about entrepreneurship is it's lonely. Um, uh, that's been a theme on this show. We've talked with a lot of people and that that's kind of the thing no one wants to talk about. Um, uh, or a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs are so busy with all, all these things in the queue they have to do that they don't even take 10 minutes a day to kind of sit back and analyze the unanalyzed life is not worth living all that kind of stuff. Um, I find that, you know, my, my, uh, buddy, uh, who runs a scout IT company, uh, an Apple IT company here in Tampa Bay, you know, he, he was like, he basically dubbed me a business therapist. And <laughs> I feel like you, I've, I'm getting the vibe. That's how y'all sit down in discovery meeting. Is that <laughs> on point? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good, good because, way to look at it. That's right. Well, because, you know, and especially when I tell him I'm a stand-up comedian as a moonlighting career, that kind of, what that, that opens up the conversation a lot faster, I would say, because they feel more comfortable to say whatever a little bit too much a lot of the time. Uh, but I would say like, um, when you, even if you're a mom and pop shop and you grew a business and it's doing well, you still don't have that, that mom, if you're the pop to talk to, because they're doing, a, they're, it's a delegation of duties, right? right? And so the plight is so, it's so like within the, the entrepreneur itself. And I feel like a lot of it, a lot of the coaching aspect in y'all's field 
has to be more psychology than anything. Like you can definitely, you can definitely teach about P and L's and you can teach about profitability. I mean, that's almost, uh, you know, as, as standard as it can come, um, sitting with them and maybe get them to understand it's one part, but it's got to, you got to be breaking down psychology a lot. Now it's really interesting. You tap in on curiosity. Why is cur- but why is curiosity the thing that, okay, this is the indicator for us on someone that is coachable. I mean, I know you said it a little bit earlier, but I've never heard anybody qualify anybody by curiosity. I find that interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and again, as we went back and analyzed not only successes that, that we'd had, but also you know with clients of ours and just in our in our past life, as we started looking at, at those qualities that we found to be very uh, a key indicator for somebody to to be successful, that curiosity was was one of them. And again, the, the folks that feel like they kind of know it all or, or or they're there or they aren't willing to make those changes, again, that just shows hey, it's very time to kind of get out of business, you know, for, for, for those folks. You know, but it's funny you talk about, you know, the, the psychology part of it. You know, one of the things that we, that we tend to specialize in is, is working with spouses. And that's something that I grew up with. You know, my, my parents started a company when I was like three years old. And oh, I thought, actually, yeah, that's a different upbringing. Yeah. Well, I thought it was normal, right? Because, you know, here they, they had a successful company for 40 years and had a successful marriage for, for over 50 years. And right? I figured that was just kind of normal stuff. And then I, I got into the real world and realized how unusual my parents were to have, to have success in both of those where most folks will, will lose one or the other. And so we, you know, we, we, we had some clients early on where they, you know, they, they didn't bridge that gap very well in terms of, you know, the, the home versus, versus work, right? Or you talk about, you know, the fact that, that their partners, you know, they don't necessarily talk about all, all the right things or, or they don't have kind of that structure in place to, to, to make sure that they, they don't lose themselves or lose their, their personal relationship as well. And all of a sudden starts to come all business. And so a big part of what we help them do is understand, well, here's where to make some dividing lines to make sure, hey, here's business versus here's at home. And you know, here's ways to kind of handle stuff. And as I, as I look back on my parents, that was one of the keys for their success was my mom was very good at saying, hey, you know what? It's six o'clock, this wait till tomorrow, right? You know, let's, let's, let's have family time right now. Now, if, if there's a true emergency, yeah, we can handle that. But you know, the rest of the time we can kind of hold on to it. And so as I was growing up, my dad would always keep a little note, like a little note card in his pocket. And I, I always see him kind of grab it and kind of you know, write something down and kind of stick it back in there. So as a young kid, I'm thinking, you know, the, the old man's like losing it or something, right? Here he's kind of, you know, putting stuff in. And he said, no, he said, what happens is I realized that I get ideas all the time. Yep. And I don't necessarily say, if, if I don't write it down and capture it now, I'm not going to remember it tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. You know, he goes, so the, the ideas just don't come from eight to five. They come all the time. So, so I learned I have to kind of capture those things and, and make sure that they're there. So, you know, if your mom says, hey, let's wait to talk about it till tomorrow. Okay, I put a little note down. We'll talk about, you know, at breakfast tomorrow, you know, as we're getting ready to kind of plan our day. And so they, they were very good about kind of doing that and, and be able to kind of separate, you know, who, who is in charge, you know, one place versus another. And so they talked about these things. Well, what we realized as many couples don't talk about these things or it's like they they get into business together because I think that'll, that'll help fix us, right? If we're together all the time, it'll make us better. It, it's kind of like having a baby to kind of fix a bad relationship. It, it's, it's not a good idea from that standpoint. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we've seen, we've seen a lot of those kind of things start to happen, right? Or We're a to save the marriage, yeah. Right, yeah. or or if you get it, if your spouse is too, a lot of times like you're not having discussions you should be having as business partners because you want to get laid tonight, right? So it's also you just don't talk about it. And it's like, wait a minute, right. you have to kind of cover these things. You know, don't worry about sleeping on the couch, right? You know, this is this is important to make sure you guys have these have these discussions. So a lot of times we we become that facilitator, or when we have partners like that too, they'll often come to us in between and talk one on one. Because often they'll, they'll talk differently one-on-one and we'll be that conduit to kind of deliver the message or be able to kind of, you know, they'll, they'll hear it from a different voice from that standpoint. So we have a lot of couples. We also have a lot of partners we, we, you know, that, that we work with over the years. And, and with, with us being a partnership too, we can relate to those kind of things as well because we've been together, like I said, about almost 20 years now. It's been crazy. Yeah, that, that's a tough dynamic because I've had to walk um, business owners, entrepreneurs through that when they, have, they go, oh, my my wife is, you know, partner with me on this as well. She handles X, Y, and Z. And I go, okay, now we have to pivot into talking about work-life balance because uh, your number one, let's call it, I know it's a partner. I know it's an owner too, but let's call it your number one employee too, as well. Like if they're handling all the things you don't like to handle, which is typically administrative, clerical, accounting, you know, more right, ten- uh, other stuff. That's right. Tends to, be, tends to be more of the soft skill stuff. Uh, but, you know, are, are you putting down getting laid in your iCal? You know, making sure, because uh, it, it works the other way too. Because if the sure guy, does. if the husband's not getting laid, he's going to be irritable. 
unfortunately. <laughs> You know, that, that's that's right. Right. <laughs> and like just be a grumpy asshole all the time and you go well how did this happen and it, it really i i'm kind of um you know admire it sounds like your parents relationship was really good adam because it's not easy to to really be around each other that much and uh and then you got to manage a house like a business that's how i look at it like right. you know um I try to grit out every 15 minutes of my day on a to-do list, you know, every morning, just so I, I'm kind of structured because I was way out of whack trying to play catch up all the time. And I go, I don't want this life. And I, I want to be present when I have my kids. I'm a single dad with two kids. And so it's kind of like, I got them 50% of the week. I want to be present. So I have to cut off work when I've got them. Cause you just, they're just all over me. But like in the same respect, uh, you know, how, did, how you grew up in Cleveland and your parents had an advertising agency. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. So you didn't know any different. I find that. So it, like my family's the opposite. I grew up in a, a lot of non-entrepreneurial, like a lot of like get your gold watch when you retire, you know, put in, stay with one company as long as you can, if you can, you know, um, very risk averse, I would say. And not, and not that that's a bad thing either. It just not my personality uh and i i've always been kind of entrepreneurial how how did what, what was that household like well we you know it was just part of the, the dinner time discussions you, you know if something was kind of going on you know if there's a big deal happening or things are happening in the company or if there's some cutbacks happening or if they're if they're looking to, to, to buy another company again we, we were just kind of aware of it you know and just not realizing until i look back and i go wow you know this was kind of interesting discussions because again i thought everybody kind of had the same the same talks but i had some friends who had you know had parents who had jobs and they didn't talk about business at all or if they did it was all bad stuff hey the, you know the man's keep me down doing like it was all this victim stuff and i think wait a minute no you know you can control your your destiny you know and so and, and, and as i look back at all the jobs i had growing up you know whether it be caddying or you know i was setting up bingo for, for different stuff or you know i was always attracted to, to those positions where there was there's upside there's more the entrepreneurial bent to it even when I went, went to Wall Street, the, the place I chose was Bear Stearns because it was more of an entrepreneurial place. And everybody I met there was different. So I said, hey, it's a chance to kind of come into some place and kind of just be yourself versus you kind of, you fit, you know, some sort of mold. And so I guess just kind of growing up, you know, it kind of gave me that, that, that quiet confidence to kind of know. And again, a, a lot of folks I met caddying too were entrepreneurs, you know, guys like Jack who reinforced a lot of those things and talked about, and, and they were always the happiest guys. You know, the, the, the folks right. are, they're, they're kind of doing their own things. Look, if you want to control your own destiny, you got to work for yourself. If you work for, if you work for somebody else, they're going to move you around. If, you know, if you're successful, they're going to move you here and do that. It's going to be very, very difficult. And you aren't going to control yourself. And I saw right. a lot of those folks when I was in New York, you know, who were uh, by outside means, you know, you judge them being successful. But to me, they're going on vacation, taking their, their nannies with them. I'm going, well, wait a minute. You know, you had kids. Why? Just so you can reproduce because you're, you're so wonderful. I mean, again, you know, I, I want to have a family and, and kind of see them, you know? I'm cool with the nanny thing because I was just talking, I've just been complaining about going on vacation with your kids is worse than it's harder than normal life. It's okay. not cool. There's no chill. It's like, please don't <laughs> die in the water. Please don't let a fire work without me. Please, you know, like, please don't die in this other area environment. Uh, Jack, what, what was your environment growing up? Uh, presumably your parents uh, met in the water best. <laughs> My dad, my dad was a uh, steel worker. He, he worked uh, blue collar all the way. Uh, my mother, homemaker, worked a department store, you know, 20, 30 hours a week kind of thing. So it was a typical Cleveland Rust Belt kind of uh, upbringing. Didn't know any better. I thought we were rich, but we weren't. So that's a good grounding. <laughs> I never knew we were poor. Not really poor, but you know, at that low, lower uh, workaholic kind of uh, uh, situation where you know he, he was a, a factory worker. So that was my that was my experience. I hope Motivated, my kids he was a, he was a good amateur amateur uh, athlete. He he was real good, and so I played football and basketball. You know, I played a lot of sports as a young guy, and uh, lucked out. You know, I had a nice career in a public traded company, vice president, and he wanted me to move on to uh, Canada as president of our Canadian operation. And I said, no, I didn't want to do it. No victimhood or anything. I just didn't want to do it. I knew I was pretty good and I could land on my feet no matter where I was. Plus, I was a lot younger than I am now. 
and uh, it worked out well. No complaints. Well, how, how do you tune? Do you do anything to tune yourself to to make that decision? Meaning, like a lot of people in that position would just take it because it's the next rung on the ladder, right? That's right. I feel like, I feel like yeah, and we talk about it on our show. It's for entrepreneurs or people with the side hustle, but it's also all the same rules apply if you're trying to move up a corporate ladder as well. You have to kind of be entrepreneurial in, in that way, in, in a way of like, you know, you're, you're your own boss. You need to excel more than, you know, the 100% kind of thing uh, to get where you want to be. Do you, what, how, how did you know, like, this wasn't the right move for me? What was it in your bones that you felt? You know, law, it's funny. People people ask me, how could you leave a big corporate spot as a VP with all that good stuff ahead of you? Well, it wasn't good stuff. It, it wasn't horror or anything, but it, it 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 wasn't right for me. You know, people who do what I did will give a story. They'll give a reason why they did that. And that's bullshit. They don't know why. I didn't know why, but I knew I was okay. I, I you know, financially, I had stocked away enough and, and being a VP in a public company and a lot of perks. So I was okay with that. And so was my wife. And, and uh, so I took some time off. And it was, it was great. You know, I was 39 years old. And it, it, was, it was just a good time to do something like that. So I got two sons. We, you know, did stuff together. And I got, you know, talked to people I hadn't talked to in years. And just the whole, put my feet up and just relax for a while. It was great. So yeah. I, I, and when I got I'll, into the small business stuff, I uh, did it again when I, you know, I was buying companies and when I sold one, you know, I sold another and bought a couple more and did some consulting and just kicked around a lot of things. And I said, Hey, I like these guys. They're blue collar guys for the most part. And I know, I know that world. I know it well, and I'm comfortable with it. So it was, uh, it was just done without, I can give a reason, but I don't, I wasn't thinking like that when I left. And I left totally on my own terms. Yeah, and a lot of people don't set themselves to be up to be able to do that, right? That's part of being- well, no, I'll, I'll disagree with you, because they can, uh, but they never they take that no, no, step. They can, a lot of people don't, is what I'm saying. You know? Yeah, they got that, this sense of false security that working for a big company or taking a big position is going to be worth it. Oh, it's bullshit. But I didn't know that because I never did it. And I never knew anybody who did it. And, uh, you know, but I liked entrepreneurs. And I like blue collar guys. So I don't like the suits and the, the nonsense that goes with all that. And, uh, you know, the, the office politics. You got to be assertive and you got to be aggressive. You really do with, you know, you got to hone the edge a little bit, but for the most part, that's how you make it in, in big corporations. It's cutthroat. It's not fun. You know, in that sense, it's not fun. And yeah. uh, I didn't know what fun is. <laughs> I, well, I, it's not satisfying at the end of the day, right? That's all. Oh, that's for sure. That's for sure. I, I People don't talk, talk about, about that, but they don't live it. I don't talk about being happy. I talk about being satisfied. I think happy is a, a, a a goal that's unachievable almost in one way. I agree. I agree with you. Yeah. Like being content, satisfied, satiated. What are the things that get you up in the morning? I think myself, like y'all, I love being able to be part, part of that engine that helps, you know, a small business owner that needs help, you know, that little jigsaw piece to help them kind of get on their way. And then, and then it's, it's the best when I see clients that I had, sell their business, you know, sometimes to big conglomerates, that's fine. That's what they wanted to do. That was their end goal. There's nothing prouder. There's no better dinner to go have with that client once they're done, you know, with that sale and kick your heels up and just go, I, I'm, I don't know. There's some commun communal kind of acts of service with it. It feels yeah, like we get, we get teared up when, when uh, we have a success, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll start crying if I keep talking about it right now. But uh, yeah, no, yeah. we do. It, it it hits you like that. You know, some people, especially, it's just uh, you know, you're you changing their lives, right? Yeah, you're changing you're changing their lives and their employees' lives in a lot of ways. Absolutely.
you know, you know, one of the things that you know I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs over the years. Even when I was in New York, a lot of the folks who advised were entrepreneurs. And the one guy said something that really stuck with me. He said, "Look, is that if if you're going to work every day and it feels like work, it's a time. It's a, it's a sign you have to do something different. You know, it's probably something different. And and I was coming into work at that point, and it felt like work. And I started looking ahead at guys who were 10, 20 years older than me to kind of look at the path ahead. And I was like, I don't want to be on that path. And it takes a little bit of courage to step off. You know, there's a, there's a, a famous quote in the, in the movie Wall Street where uh, the, the old guy's talking to Charlie Sheen about looking out, staring into the abyss, right? So if you picture somebody standing out on this ledge, taking that taking that step off, going to you know going to do your own thing, you know the folks in corporate America are not encouraging you that they're, they're trying to they're trying to you know damage your psyche. Say, well, you know, you need us, right? You know, you, you, you know, you don't know how good you are until you take that step off. And so the, the key is to take that step. And usually, what you do is if if you're good, you find out just how good you are. And you realize that you know you don't have all the answers, but you can figure stuff out. You can come back to the whole curiosity thing. You'll figure out the answers. You'll you'll tap into people. You'll find a way to not to not go back to that place. And it's rare that folks leave the corporate world and go back. It happens once in a while, but it's, you know it's very usually once they go, they go. Why did I wait so long? You know. So I did it when I was thirty years old. You know, because I, I said, why wait till I'm sixty to to do what I want to do? Yeah, I, I want to do it now. So let's go do it now. And so you know, I, that's why I started looking around for for people and, look, and decide. What I was looking to do, that's when, when Jack and I got, got reconnected. And it just, it, it was good timing. You know, I didn't know we were, we were going to start a coaching company, but we, we kind of evolved into that. That's, that's part of just kind of going and finding people who, who you like doing stuff with. And you start to start to discover, but the freedom there is fantastic. You know, the, 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 the shackles of corporate America and, and, and the bureaucracy and how long it takes to get stuff done. And it's like, give me a break. It's like, let's have an idea today. Let's go try it out. Let's see right. how it goes. And, and, and let's learn from that, you know, and, 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 but it's, it's so much more fun to be able to kind of try those kind of things and it's much more fulfilling and we have a lot of fun. So yeah, you know, it's, it's been 20 years of hard work here, but we, we enjoy it. So it's not work. It's, it's very fulfilling. Yeah. And I, it, um, you know, in the pandemic, they talked about, I read an article, I think it was wall street journal was talking about how uh, in, in the pandemic, it really showed how much mayors in every city, uh, you know, really had to react and really step up their game uh, and be agile. I feel like the small business lifestyle is about being agile, it is about, okay, this isn't working. We tried it. Let's go this way. Where if you're at Bear Stearns, like you, when, when were you at Bear Stearns? In the mid 90s. So 95 to 97. So it was oh, 10 after, years before it collapsed. Okay. But after the crash of 87, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. And so, yeah, you were there in a crazy time, Wolf of Wall Street era, yep. I guess. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> throwing midgets on a, a dartboard. Um, <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> uh, uh, um, but I mean, it was one of those things where just, I just watched that movie the other day and I was like, I don't, that environment isn't good for me. It's, it's nice to walk through the hallway. And if you saw that, it'd be cool or see it in a movie, but that doesn't work for me. I want to be agile with your life as well. Um, I so we try to keep these episodes about thirty three minutes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I got two questions, and I, uh, we'll definitely have y'all back on because we barely just peeled the onion a, at all. And um, so one question I have, I have a disdain for business coaches, um, and you guys are coaches. I know that, so <laughs> I'm not. I I'm, I'm setting this up to put foot in mouth in a way, but. Uh, there's a lot of like, it, it, in the same regard, there's a lot of motivational speakers uh, that I don't, I don't have a trust for. It's good. It's temporary. How do you guys separate yourselves as a real legitimate business coach? Because I can tell just by talking to you this short amount of time, you're legitimate. Uh, whereas I, I get a bad uh, evangelical preacher feeling out of uh, a lot of business coaches in quotes. <laughs> we've we've gone from 20 years ago when we first started doing this people were saying what the heck's a business coach to about five eight years into the like well tell me why you're different than these other six people that, that, that i met here, here in the last month right and so usually what we saw and the reason we got into this, this business we saw people that were coaches that, that had no idea about business you know and so usually we find is you have folks that are life coaches or career coaches they said well coaching's coaching and it's like okay that's not, not the case when it comes to business or they've only got one uh, area of expertise Maybe they're a salesperson, or maybe maybe they're more of a marketer, maybe they're, they're more of a numbers person, but they don't bring that, that that kind of complete picture from that standpoint. And so, you know, with Jack and I, what we, we focus on is trying to help to create those owners to become CEOs, to, you know, to be able to run the business. We we joke and say, look, the goal is 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 you, you get the company to the point where Jack and I can run it. 
even though we have no knowledge at all about your product or service, but you get the, the company that, to that level, then we can be able to kind of run it from that standpoint. So we've, we've been able to bottle up our combined almost 100 years of experience here to kind of put it down and say, here's how we simply be able to apply it to the owners of small companies. And having two of us together, we, we coach all our clients together. And we start doing that very early on and realize it's very helpful to have different eyes and ears on stuff to make sure that we don't miss stuff. And we're very straightforward with how we, how we coach our clients. It's always, it's a flat monthly fee. We're available 24 seven. We're there as partners for them. We aren't nickel and diming with stuff. So a lot of things that, that people do that, that really annoy people, we, we, st you know, we don't do that. That's not, not, not how we are. We're there to be able to, to deliver value. And it's always month to month. You know, we aren't making people sign six month, one year contracts. Most of our clients stay with us for years. Our, 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 our longest term clients have been, been over 10 years with us. And as long as they want to keep getting better and growing, we, we know what it looks like to be at a startup phase. We know what it looks like to be a multi-billion dollar company and everything in between, right? So no matter where you're at or, or where you want to go, we, we can help you get there if you stay coachable and, 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 and if, you, if you kind of follow our guidance. If you don't, we can always walk away. Hey, it's been, it's been, it's been a great couple of years, but now we're going to kind of part ways and you know, see how things kind of go. So we're always very focused on that part of it to make sure that we're helping them. And it's a focus on helping them get better, not on us. It's always on them. Well, all those principles you just laid down, uh, maybe, shit, maybe I'll be on your careers page on your website soon, looking for something. Uh, um, the last question we asked, and it's the question we ask everybody the first time on the podcast, uh, what advice would you give your 13-year-old self? I don't, who wants to go first? Me. I would, what, today with what I know, I have a grandson, and I've been trying to subtly drive uh, entrepreneurism into him. And he's got it. He's, uh, he graduated college about a year ago. And he's, he's uh, a, a guy who gets up front, takes charge, and he's, he's doing things that I wished I would have done. I don't have any regrets really, but if I were to answer this question, you know, it's to go back and become entrepreneurish at an earlier age. Adam had an advantage of that, but we often miss the advantage. We often miss uh, those opportunities. I would start sooner, uh, but what do you think? What do you think? No complaints. You well, just just the environment. You know, if you don't know what you don't know, how do you start it? And and that's you know that's why it's impossible to to really grasp it quickly unless some, there's a mentor kind of driving it into you. Not driving it in a, in a negative way, but just subtle hints and encouragement and set things up for him unbeknownst to him and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's you, you grew up in an era, you grew up in an era where entrepreneurship wasn't as prevalent, especially in the region, right? It was a lot more like like I was saying, like you go to work, you get the gold watch, you retire. It's yeah. that kind of uh, lunch pail kind of. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, I had paper routes and things like that. I mean, you know, go back. Hey, when I was a kid, and, you know, we walked, uh, you know, ten miles in the snow, that kind of thing. It uh, uphill both uh, ways. Yeah, I, we know. <laughs> I like, I like the, I like the awareness of, of a, you know, of, of a good mentor, someone who's working with you and encourages you, and all of a sudden the light can go on. I think that would have been. So I wouldn't, you know, I'd like to sidestep big corporations. I'm sure it gave me good training. It did. I mean, I got great insight and learned business and and uh, learn organizations pretty well. So I don't know. It's a tough question to ask, really. I know. It's a brilliant question. I feel like a genius. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a 19-year-old, a 16-year-old. So I, I keep telling the same kind of things that uh, here's the goal of school is to help you find what you like and what you're good at. If you can figure those things out, you, you can always find a way to make money at it. And I also say now school doesn't have, have, have everything in it. School has a very limited number of things in it. And so this whole idea of having to go to college, it's a bunch of BS, right? I mean, college is right for certain people. Not, not everybody needs to go to college. Okay. You know, lots of ways to kind of figure yourself out. So I've been trying to encourage my kids from a very young age. So, so my daughter, who's, who's 16, is very good at, at art and drawing and painting. So I've been encouraging her to, to try to monetize that. You know, versus, you know, just go, go get a job somewhere and be miserable. So look, look around, look at all these signs around her. Somebody creates these signs. Imagine you, could, you, know, you can create a sign like that and, and get paid for it. And once you see them start to earn some money and how they kind of light up, that's why you, you get that entrepreneurial spirit, you know, kind of making your money and seeing that you can, you can adjust the value. You don't have to go work for a certain dollar per hour. You can go, you know, kind of almost kind of name your price a little bit. So the idea of entrepreneurship, even today, still isn't being taught in school as much. Again, they're, they're being trained for jobs that, you know, I don't know if they, a lot don't exist these days. That's why there's a big gap in terms of 
you know, jobs available versus, you know, lack of people who are qualified for them. But, you know, to me, to, to encourage the kids to try to find what you like, what you're good at, you can always find a way to make money, especially today. There's a lot more ways to be able to make money today than there ever were before. And so to be able to kind of focus on that versus just trying to, you know, get your, get your degree and hopefully get a job somewhere and, and just be miserable for the next 40 years. You know, we're trying to keep as many folks away from that as we can. Yeah, and like you could, um, there's a lot to chew off of what you just said. Uh, and I definitely want to have you guys on selfishly just to ask you, you both in a longer form uh, interview, how I can foster my kids' entrepreneurial kind of uh, vibe uh, if I can. But um, it's like you're saying with your daughter, you know, uh, you know, get that Etsy store going, get your Pinterest going. That's where the moms are. Moms buy a lot of this stuff. And it's not icky. If you need me to come in and do like a halftime speech to get her riled up, because <laughs> I get a lot of people that think I'm a creative in the professional world uh, right. because of the stand up. And it's vice versa in the other way. When I'm in stand up world, they think I'm like a button up professional. And I'm like, these worlds aren't separate. There's, uh, they're both entrepreneurial. And just because you're creative doesn't mean you can't have a business. Uh oh, we lost them. Well, <laughs> let's wait to see if he comes back. It's still recording, Jack. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So we'll give him a minute to come back. If not, I guess we'll we'll hang it up and then he'll come back at us. There's still only two of us here, it looks like. Well, I'll have to end the meeting and then he'll he'll reach back out to us. Maybe we kind of kind of finished up to where we wanted to get to. We already went over the 33 minutes he was looking to get to. So Yeah. Yeah. All right, let me hit end meeting for all. I'll see you tomorrow. You don't have, you don't have his uh you don't have his uh text. No. Yeah. No. Just an email. But I mean he has he has the link to get in here, right? Good thing he's recording in the cloud. It's still recording in the cloud. I can see it. Do you see the cloud on your screen? No. Where oh. should I see it? Uh, well, I see it in the top left of my screen. But well, let's wait to hear from him again. This, this is what kind of he was kind of fi finalizing that you know this episode. He wants to kind of reach back out. So we'll we'll wait for Law to reach back out to us. And we'll get another time schedule. It sounds like. Good. All right. That was fun. Yeah, it was. It was a lot All of right. fun. All right. I'll see you tomorrow. Yep. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.